Welcome to the Performance Enhancing Podcast. It's like steroids for your brain. A podcast for people looking to live life at their peak potential. Chock full of real world tools and knowledge that you can apply in your life today. By providing you with a lens into the lives, beliefs, practices, and actions of those who are already living extraordinary lives, the Performance Enhancing Podcast will help you shift your mindset or create that change in your daily rituals and habits so you can explode with success in the areas of life that are most important to you. So get ready for another dose of Performance Enhancing Podcast with Satori Prime. Here's your host, Elon Ferdman. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another Performance Enhancing Podcast with your host, Elon Ferdman. So if you haven't signed up to our PEP list to receive a recap email about this week's shows, make sure you head over to performancepodcasts.com. That's podcasts with an S at the end of it. So make sure you remember that. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to our show via iTunes, you can also do that at performancepodcasts.com backslash iTunes. Or if you prefer to use Stitcher, you can do the same thing at performancepodcast.com backslash Stitcher. And remember, we have new episodes coming out every Monday and Thursday morning, so you can grab those then. Lastly, if you want to keep up with everything that we do at Satori Prime, you can always head over to our main site, satoriprime.com, and roam around. We have a ton of free content that we constantly update. And if any of you are looking for some mentorship around your marketing efforts, and I'm talking specifically about Facebook paid marketing on how you can use that to double, triple, or even quadruple your business, then we do actually have a couple of masterminds we run that can absolutely transform your marketing efforts in less than 90 days. So you can check those out by applying to see if you're a fit for one of them at satoriprime.com backslash mastermind. And with that, let's kick off today's show. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And today we're going to take another cut at goals. And this time from a very, very different angle, we're going to talk about forming habits. And we're going to talk about it with a gentleman by the name of James Clear, who has one of the best blogs ever. Uh, You can absolutely check it out, jamesclear.com. But I want to introduce you to this guy because He's studied consumer psychology and then took that and mapped it into health and fitness and then mapped that into creating behavioral change, real world behavioral change in people, people that struggle to lose weight or build a business or achieve some sort of goal, breaks things down to the simplest form of how you can make that happen. In fact, his blog, just so you understand, in the last two years, has grown from zero to now 500,000 readers per month and 130,000 person mailing list, all in a span of two years. So this is the man that we're gonna talk to today, incredible, incredible human being. And on part one, we're gonna discuss an amazing story that he heard by Richard Branson that actually got him off the sidelines and on the court, and I think he can do the same for you. How to know if what you're researching and the things that you're actually studying online are real or not, which I know can be tricky sometimes, we're then also going to look at the power of consistency and how entrepreneurship is not about necessarily focusing on a result, but it's about focusing on completing your daily task or whatever the action plan was and how that drives the results. And he credits a lot of that to 500,000 in two years. In fact, he says that the biggest breakthrough for him came out of trying a bunch of different things and then figuring out what came easiest to him. So without further ado, let's introduce you to James Clear. I'm sure you're going to absolutely love this one. And before we do that, again, just a quick reminder, head over to storyprime.com backslash 10, the number 10 hyphen day hyphen challenge for our 10 part 10 day challenge series where you can have a massive breakthrough in an area of life that's important to you in just 10 days flat. We actually use some of the things that James Clear is going to share with us here today. Enjoy this interview. We'll see you on the next one. All right, guys, welcome back. I'm really, really excited. Uh, I met this guy through a friend of mine. His name is James Clear, as I mentioned before. 
but the wealth of knowledge that this man possesses on everything having to do with habit forming, mindset, willpower, uh, is just going to blow your mind. And we've kind of, James, I didn't let you know, but we've been on this kick ever since the new year started about setting your goals, the science behind achieving your goals and all that stuff. So Mm -hmm. this couldn't have come at a better time. So first of all, welcome. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. And before we kind of delve into it, tell people a little bit about yourself because, you know, I, I kind of hate reading off bios and letting people yeah, know that. Sure. So. so I've been an entrepreneur for four years now. Um, I come from the background, mostly the science background. Uh, I, you know, I was an athlete growing up my whole life, played a bunch of different things through high school and then ended up playing baseball through college. Uh, so I had this background with health and wellness and fitness. So I was really interested in, in health and the human body and athletics. And as a, as a student, I was interested in science. So I studied biomechanics in undergrad, which was mostly chemistry and physics classes. And then when I got done, I went to grad school and um, I, in between my first and second year, I worked in a medical practice. So I had all these different touch points with health and wellness, sports and school and, and work. And when I was in graduate school, I was studying business. Um, and uh, my job was to analyze venture capital investment in the region. Mm. So I saw all these people rolling out different businesses. And that was where I started to get the itch myself to like, hey, maybe I could start something too. So I graduated and started my business a couple years ago. But, you know, I knew nothing in the beginning. I started a bunch of terrible ideas, had a bunch of things flop, all that uh, typical entrepreneur story. But what happened was I had to start studying consumer psychology and behavioral psychology to figure out, you know, how do people make a purchase? Why do people buy certain things? How yeah. can I get them to sign up for my email list? All these things that I knew nothing about. Well, as I started studying the psychology stuff for business, for the, for entrepreneurship, I naturally started applying all that back to my health and fitness background. I would read something about psychology and be like, Hey, this could work in the gym. This could help me with fitness habits. So this could help me with nutritional habits in the kitchen, or I could use this for, you know, whatever yeah. my personal goal was that I was working on. And that was when I kind of went down this rabbit hole of habit formation and behavior change and the science of psychology and why we do the things that we do. Um, and so that was a couple of years ago when I started that I wrote in private for about a year about those topics. Um, why in private? Well, all sorts of excuses. What it really comes down to was I was a big wimp. Um, you know, I, <laughs> when I started, I knew, en I knew enough to know that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so my thought was, whatever I do, I'm going to totally screw up, which I did. Um, and I don't want to do the thing that I really care about, which is this you know, intersection between health and habits and behavior change. And Because if I do that and I fail, then I'm going to really feel bad. So mm. I, I, you know, w just wimped out and wrote in private for like a year. And that document got to be like 60 pages long before wow. I was like, this is just ridiculous. You should share something. You should put something out there. So November 12th, 2012, I published my first article and I had a, uh, you know, the backstory. I had a friend who's a published author and I said, uh, his name's Todd. I was like, Todd, I only write whenever I feel motivated or inspired. Cause I feel like that's when I get my best idea. That's when I get the spark of inspiration. What do you think of that? And he was like, well, that makes sense. I only write when I feel motivated too. It just happens to be every day at 8 a.m. And I was like, <laughs> oh, like this is the difference between professionals and amateurs, right? Like yeah. amateurs do things when it's easy for them, when they feel motivated, when they're inspired. Professionals do things on a schedule. And so I set this Monday, Thursday schedule, November 12th, 2012 was the first Monday. And then I published on Thursday. And then I've just done that every Monday and Thursday since. Um, so that's, that's kind of the backstory of how I stumbled into this, this world of habits and psychology and behavior change and how I really got into it. Well, ironically enough, our podcast is also every Monday and Thursday. So I think that's a really good schedule. <laughs> nice. You know, the caveat of that is I, I had someone else like months before tell me, oh, you should write every day, uh, five days a week. So I tried that for a month and I completely burn out. Yeah. So I think like you have to have consistency. You have to have a schedule that you stick to. But the caveat is it's got to be something you can sustain. Yeah. Um, and Monday, Thursday is a pace that I can sustain. I mean, look, it's still to me an aggressive pace, but I like to be on that teeter totter where it's like, it, it's got to push you enough mm. where you got to push yourself. Yeah. But I think, and I don't know if this is your, for me, it's also like a little bit of a selfish thing in a weird way because I wanted some accountability to have to continuously learn. 
And I know that every Monday and every Thursday people are waiting. Like, and mm -hmm. when iTunes delays a release for whatever reason, cause some gremlin is in there, people are emailing me and like, dude, where is the episode? Yeah. Uh, I know that now I have no option to back out or, you know, not. I agree with you. Back. You know, it's very interesting. Like if you look, you know, if you, if you just rewind the clock to two years ago or um, two and a half years ago, I, I was not an expert on habits and behavior change at that time. I knew a fair amount, but I, I hadn't shared anything, but then yeah. just by virtue of showing up every week and by writing about it every week, I mean, now just for context, so I get about half a million visitors to my site each month and wow. my email list is about 130,000 people. So when I send out something at this point, it's reaching a fair number of, you know, of people and, and making a decent impact. And the only reason that that expertise was built is because I showed up every Monday and Thursday. So I, I totally hear what you're saying about like forcing yourself into some type of consistent learning mode. You know, like I, I basically force myself to become an expert by showing up each week. Exactly. Exactly. I want to just go back one second. So November 12th, 2012, something shifted. What was that process? You, you went from being a wimp to all of a sudden like, Hey, I'm just going to put this out there. What was the mindset shift? What, what happened? Yeah. Well, so there's actually a story that prompted it. I, uh, you know, I had been, it had been coming for, for a while, right? Like I had been writing in private. I've been thinking about it. I've, I've been telling people, Oh, I kind of want to do this, but I just hadn't stepped up yet. So it was, it was there. It was on the brink. But what happened was what put me over the edge. I, I got invited to this conference in Russia. So I go over to Moscow and we got to see Richard Branson speak. Wow. And, uh, we, so it was really cool. We got to, you know, see him, shake his hands, stand by by side by side, all that stuff. And he sits down for this little hour conversation and he was super candid, by the way, I felt like his responses weren't canned and stuff. I've had that before where like you meet some or see some, you know, big time yeah. person, it's just a real disappointment. He, he wasn't like that. Um, anyway, so he's talking and as he gets done with this story, one, one of the stories he tells is how he started Virgin Airlines and I'll retell it here as best I can remember. But he basically said, um, you know, I was a young entrepreneur. I was in my early 20s. Nobody really knew who I was at the time. I wasn't this famous guy. And uh, I was on a flight in the Caribbean. I was going from one island to the other. And the flight that night got canceled because of maintenance or something like that. There was no weather problems. He was like, I didn't, I wasn't like rich the way I am now. I didn't have money to like charter a private plane, but I went ahead and called about it and booked it anyway. And then I got this, this was like in the 70s. So I got this little chalkboard. And he wrote Virgin Airlines $29 on it and walked over to all the people who had their flight canceled with him, <laughs> sold the rest of the spots on the chartered plane, and then used their money to help pay for the thing. And they all went there that night. That's awesome. And yeah, it was just such a classic Branson story. And like, you know, how many of us have had a flight canceled and how many people went and chartered a plane because of it? I mean, it's just so rare for someone to take that level of action when faced with a problem. And, uh, you know, later in the panel, he's talking about the possibilities like mining asteroids for their natural resources and all this other ridiculous stuff. And I, as I was sitting there, cause he's, he's on this panel and all these brilliant people are up there with him and he's the only one who's a billionaire. And I was like, what is different about this guy? Yeah. And I felt like that story just encapsulated the fact that he started before he felt ready. I mean, he had no airline background, no engineering experience, no reason to think that he could charter a plane and sell tickets to people but he decided to start anyway. And that was the thing that like pushed me forward. I was like, you know what, if he can start without feeling ready, everybody starts without feeling ready. Like that's yeah. just how it is. And so I, I stepped up after that and started publishing. It's pretty funny. I, I, one of the big things that I always tell people in coaching them is as an entrepreneur, you're going to get to a point in your business where you're going to walk over to the cliff and you're going to look down and you're going to go, holy shit, that is so scary. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then that's the choice. You just fall over the edge and you figure out how to fly on the way down. And I think that's what sets apart successful entrepreneurs and those that, you know, will stand there looking over and trying to figure it out for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, there's, there's always going to be some level of uncertainty, some yeah. level of like, I, I don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, you know, even now when my, now that my business is more established and I can at least project a little bit, I really don't have any true idea of what's going to happen in six months or a year or whatever, but I have enough trust in myself that whatever it is, I know I'm going to be able to figure it out. Yeah. And that, that I think that's like the essence of entrepreneurship. You just have to trust yourself that you will figure it out. Yeah. And I mean, shit always happens. And especially with a medium like online, 
I mean, a lot of it is still out of your hands as far as, you know, how they're going to rank websites or how you can right. get trapped. I mean, there's a million things that are out of our hands, but I agree with you. We've become really gifted at Facebook marketing and with, they change things like every other week, you know, right. and most people get hammered and leave the platform because they don't understand. And yet, because we've played in that trench for, you know, four years, every single day for hours a day, mm -hmm. it almost doesn't matter. It's like, we'll figure it out. That's the other thing too, is you're never finished, right? Like you, I mean, you okay. talked about this idea of it, like learning consistently and always, you know, getting to the next level. I mean, you, especially with Facebook or something that moves that fast, it's never a finish line that you cross and they're like, well, now we're successful. We have this business for good. Let's just let it run. Like you're always, you always have to be moving to the next level and reinventing yourself. hundred percent. This is a curious question because my brother and I, uh, we're talking about this and I'd like to get your opinion. Yeah. We feel like now that we've put ourselves in this context um, or sandbox or whatever you want to call it of having to push ourselves and learn and all this stuff all the time, I've actually gotten to the point and I know it's a cliche, but it's like the more, you know, the less, you know, which is <laughs> yeah. now, whereas before I ran a really successful bank for a while and I was like, Oh, I'm, I know everything. And I didn't do any, like I didn't study sales. I didn't do anything now because of this business, we're constantly learning sales, psychology, like all the things that you, you love as well. And the more I learn, the more I feel like I know nothing. Mm. Do you ever I feel think, like that? Well, I think in the beginning, when you start to look at a subject, it seems like, oh, there's this thing that I don't know. And it's more contained. Once you get into it, you start to see all the details and nuances of stuff. And you realize how multi-layered I, different things are. And that's when you start to see like, wow, there are a lot of layers that I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I can see maybe a larger picture than I did before, but there's a lot of stuff that, that doesn't seem as simple at first glance. Scientific research gives you a good example, actually. So like a lot of times you'll see some journalist write an article about a piece of research, like, you know, new study proves that gluten will, you know, blah, 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 whatever, right. Yeah. They, they come up with one headline based on a single piece of research. But if you talk to any of the researchers who probably did that study or other people in the industry, they'll be like, well, this is just a single data point amongst thousands of others. And if you can see the whole context of the issue, then you realize that it doesn't really move the needle that much. And that's, that's how scientific science works. Scientific knowledge works. I and mean, it's very incremental, but you know, from the outside looking in, you see one headline or one data point and you think it's, oh, it's this self-contained thing. But then when you get inside, you're like, wow, there's so much here. Like in order for me to get the full picture, there's a lot that I really don't know yet. Yeah. That's a really interesting topic. So you're really into health and fitness and stuff like that, right? So yeah. um, I work with this functional medicine doctor who's now kind of like my guru in that area. So it, it, it alleviates a lot of the noise of, you know, this study, right? In this study, eggs are good, eggs are bad. This, you know, it's like the million things. How do you verify the, the information that you get to be accurate? Because there are, like you said, a million studies and you don't know who formulated one study from the other. So how do mm -hmm. you get through all that noise? Yeah, I think there, there are two things that I think are useful. The first, when you're just looking at the science is you can have a rubric and I spent a lot of time last year trying to develop this research review rubric basically where it was like, okay, if it's in a certain type of journal, then it's more verifiable. If it has this type of set, blah, blah, blah. If they mention these type of, you know, statistical analyses, it's more worthwhile, all this, all this stuff. I, and I think that's, that's fine to have a baseline like that, but I don't know how much good that does simply because what really matters is do you understand the overall context of the issue and how this one study fits into the context. The problem comes in when you assign too much weight to one particular study um, rather than seeing the, the basically what the scientific consensus is from yeah. all the studies. And the hard part about that is, I mean, it's a lot of work just to get people to read one scientific study. They're so boring and poorly, you know, the way the academic studies are written that it's a lot of work to read 500 and then have an idea of what the scope looks like. So instead, what I think is more useful, which is the second strategy, is rather than getting too caught up on what the particular science says or what the cutting edge research is on a particular topic, default back to the fundamental principles that don't change. So mm -hmm. take, for example, building muscle, all right? Okay. Our knowledge, our concept of what it takes to build muscle has changed drastically over the last 500 years, 100 years, 50 years, probably even 10 years on, you know, on a cellular level, what's happening when you're doing, you know, when you're lifting weights, what's happening in the muscles, how they're reacting, all the chemical processes, all that stuff. 
But if you default back to the simple fundamental level of you need to pick up heavy things repeatedly and then gradually increase and progress to slightly heavier weights or slightly more volume or slightly greater intensity, that is a fundamental principle that will not change. And you Mm -hmm. can use that to guide your behavior regardless of what the cutting edge research says about the chemistry of building a muscle um, or the biology of the process and how it works. So rather getting caught up in the fine details of the latest science, default back to the fundamentals and use that to guide your behavior. Well, to use what you said before, right, with the fine layers. So I I get that that's the picture, right? Like lift heavy things or have more intensity, et cetera. But then the nuances and the layers is like, you know, you can work out this way and achieve these results. And then three years later, they're like, oh, no, that's crap. Do this now. (laughs) Um, and that's going to get you better results. How do you, cause you're, you're a bodybuilder, right? Uh, Olympic weightlifting is where I spend most of the time. Okay. Yeah. So in, I guess in that respect, the, the fundamentals are really clear, but if I'm say a tennis player, right? Like, and I want to work on speed and agility and things like that, my workout routines would potentially be very different than your workout routine, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of nuances there. Do you where do you find your information? Who do you go to, to get that yeah. kind of stuff? You know, this is, a, it's, it's a good question. Um, and I think, you know, regardless of the first question is what are your goals? So, you know, like you said, a tennis player or a bodybuilder or a weightlifter or whatever, will have different goals. So yeah. figure out what that is for you, uh, okay. what type of body you want to have or where you want to go. And then once you know that, then you can start to go to people in that industry or other people who are already doing the things that you want to do very similar to business, right? You can like learn from the people who are doing the best practices now. That's probably a good place to start. But uh, on a personal level for me, it's been, you know, I've been training for over 10 years now um, just between lifting in college and then being out and and training on my own afterward. Um, And honestly, there were a lot of mistakes I made in the first like five to six years. If I'd have known what I did, if I would have done what I've, what I've done the last three years for the first seven, I'd probably would be in a very different place strength, strength wise. And Mm -hmm. part of that, I don't know is avoidable. I think part of it is, is experience, you know, like it's kind of like being an entrepreneur in the beginning and there's just a lot of stuff I didn't know. And there were a lot of skill sets that I didn't have. And I had to spend those, that time building those skill sets so that I could use it later. Um, as one brief example for fitness, during college, our strength and conditioning coach had our team do a lot of the West side barbell programs, which is a lot of like powerlifting programming style. I didn't respond that well to that. Now I did it because I didn't know what else to do. And then I would get frustrated because I hit some plateaus and stuff. But, um, you know, more recently I've done a lot of volume based stuff and I've responded very well to it. So Mm -hmm. some of it is just like figuring out what your body responds to and what it doesn't respond to. And um, the same way, one of the best pieces of entrepreneurial advice I got is very similar. So for example, uh, early on, somebody told me uh, as an entrepreneur, try things until something comes easily. And yeah. that one thing made all the difference because I would sit there and be so frustrated reading these articles about how to drive traffic to my website or how to, you know, do all, get people to sign up for my email list and nothing would work. And I was like, this is so stupid. Like people are saying, this is how they're getting thousands of visitors every day and I'm trying it and three people are coming. And eventually I got to a pattern that worked for me, something that came easier than the rest. And that I think is, is sort of the solution for a lot of this. You have to be a self experimenter. You have to be willing to try things and then get the feedback on what works for your situation, your business, your body, whatever it is that, you know, that you're focused on. Yeah. I think that's such great advice. It's very similar to what I teach people in business, which is when you first start, like you had that mentor and he said, okay, here's what you need to do. And I agree with you. You kind of have to go through that process because at the beginning, you know, nothing. Mm -hmm. And there's fundamental things that you need to do in order to open your mind. But then eventually it's like uh, the analogy I use with dancing is when you start dancing at first, you're like counting, you're like looking down at your feet and doing that thing. And it's really awkward. And then you stop counting with your lips out loud and it's kind of in your head and you stop looking at your feet. And then eventually you'll get on a dance floor, you'll hear music and you're kind of like letting your own creative juices flow mm-hmm. within the sound fundamentals, but then you find your own thing. And each of us, ha- I think has our own unique ability. So I, I like that you said that it's, you know, it's just a process. Really cool. You're making me want to dance. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like that. And then I, I agree. You added that other layer of experimentation, 
which I think people only get comfortable with once they go through that initial process. Mm. Yeah, you know, this might be the one thing that I think I try to do a little differently than than a lot of people who are writing online. A lot of the time it falls into one of two buckets for people. They're either they're either really into the science and they write a lot about the theory or the latest research or the studies or whatever, or they're really into like taking action. So they just write about their experiences and you know what they do. I try to blend the two a little bit. I think it's important yeah, to have yeah. the scientific theory, but this this piece about being a self-experimenter. That is everything if you want real results in the real world. It doesn't matter how good the theories are you have or how great the science is or how wonderful the ideas are if you never take action on them or put them into practice. Yep. The only way to get progress from any of this is to be willing to experiment and put it into your own life. So 100%. I think that using that as you can use science as a way to guide you, but um, defaulting back to if it works for you, it works. And there's no, there's no greater truth than what actually works in your life. So yeah always realizing that that's where you have to come back to. 100%. I mean, I, I uh, started using nootropics uh, last year in December and I mean, had amazing results, still have amazing results. And mm -hmm. I've shared it with other people and because of body chemistry is different, your lifestyle is different, your eating habits are different, your workout habits are different. It's just going to affect everybody differently. Mm -hmm. And so I always tell people like, test it for yourself. I mean, there's no article that you're going to read that's going to tell you like, this does this for your body. You know, like, I don't need a doctor to tell me that if I drink milk, it's bad for me. I drink milk. I feel my body. It's not good. <laughs> right? like I, I have a bad, bad reaction. Right. Just like you said with weightlifting, what you're doing didn't work. And now you have this new method and it just works with your body. Yeah. It's yeah. really, really important. So I want to um, kind of seg segue a little bit to your blog and then talk about some other stuff. So two years half a million readers a month, right? Yeah, yeah, so it's been, let's see, the exact numbers, I guess, it's be 26 months, um, 500,000 readers a month, and 130 on the email list. Okay, so that is like insane results by any stretch of the imagination. Um, how, how did you get to that level so quickly? Yeah, I, there's there's probably a couple things that are all sort of coming together to to do this. So the first is um, design. So the the nice thing was, so I've, I mentioned I've been a, an entrepreneur for four years now. So I started this business after having done stuff for about eighteen months or two years. Right. Um, and so although I started it from scratch and nobody was there on day one, I at least knew how to design the website. Like I, I had built an email list up to about 15 or 20,000 before that. So I, you know, I at least like had some context for how to do that stuff. Yeah. Um, so that helps a little bit. And if you look at my design, um, I'll take you through my process pretty quickly, but if you look at my design, it's very clean. Yep. Um, I have no sidebar, a uh, very like minimalist site. My thought is I want to make it as easy as possible for the readers to fall in love with the work. And if they like the work, if they enjoy the work, if they find it useful and helpful for them, they'll want to sign up at some point. Yep. So my strategy is I, what, what is a reader looking to do when they get to a particular page? So if they click through from Facebook or Twitter or whatever, they're usually looking to read that article. So I get out of their way and let them do that. And then at different strategic points on the page, when they're looking for something to do next, that's when I put a call to action in front of them. So, you know, they get to the bottom of the article, there's a byline with a link to my newsletter page. Um, and so that's the second piece. I use a lot of landing pages. So okay. like jamesclear.com slash newsletter, that's my main signup page that drives usually over 3000 signups a month. Um, and it converts somewhere between like 78 and 82% depending. But the reason it converts so highly if you look at it, it's a super plain page, the reason is not really because it's got the world's greatest copy or the world's greatest design. It's because there's such qualified people clicking through to that. Yep. Someone just read a full article, they click through. They read you know, something on another website, they click through. So they're all warm leads. And so you know, if people, we often think that conversion is a result of the words on the page, the things that we have on page. And that's true, those impact it. But if you want to increase your conversion rate, the best thing you could do is send better traffic to the page. If people really want to sign up, they'll find a way to sign up. Um, so, that's, so that's the first thing is design. Um, the second piece is consistency. You know, it sounds so boring, but I, so take like my search engine traffic, for example. I'm not an SEO expert by any means, but my search engine traffic doubled over the last year. Well, it makes sense that it would. I wrote for one year and I had about a hundred articles. Then I wrote the second year and I added a second hundred. So now I have 
twice the amount of pieces of content to yeah. rank and show up in Google. So of course, traffic would double. So you look at like, you know, I, I don't know what I'm at now, somewhere between five and 10,000 visits a day from SEO. But if that's, if that's what I'm getting now, it's like, that's not really a consequence of anything other than the fact that I showed up and wrote like 200 plus articles. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, well, then, well written, good content, good value articles. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like every Monday and Thursday, I try to do my best. Um, yeah. And that, that segues into the consistency piece as well, which is that I know that if I write an article every Monday and every Thursday, that's about eight or nine a month. I'm going to try my best on each one, but I'm not always going to hit the mark. But if I show up and do those eight or nine, I know two or three will be good, decent. Two or three yeah. are going to stick and, and hit a little bit. And that I think is, that, that was a lesson that I, once I started seeing it, I was like, wow, this is just like weightlifting. Like if I only went to the gym whenever I felt motivated, I'd never get strong. But because I show up every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you end up putting up a good number every now and then. So yeah. um, same way with that. And, you know, once you have more pieces of content, you also have more things that could potentially rank, uh, more things that could be shared on social media, all that stuff. The, the nice thing is, once you have good pieces of content, once you have useful stuff to share, every marketing strategy is easier. SEO yeah. is easier, social is easier, but also you can reach out to other people and be like, hey, I wrote about this topic. Would you like to bring me on for an interview? Or here's an article that would be a great fit for your website. Would you like to republish it? All this stuff is much easier once you have something compelling and something that people like. So, um, yeah. And so then the, the combination effect of all those things of social and search and, um, and, uh, uh, republishing and interviews, it kind of has like started to build and escalate now. And so, you know, for the first couple months, I only had, you know, maybe 3000 visitors a month or so. Then it jumped up to maybe around 20,000 by six months in, then I was getting closer to like 70 or 80,000 by a year. And then over this last year, it's gone from like 100 to 200 to 300 to 500. Quickly. Um, about it. Yeah, about every, you know, two or three months, it starts to jump and again and again and again. So um, I think it's, it's, you know, my, I mean, I, mean, I, I don't want to say this because I know there are a lot of people who have been running sites for more than two years that don't have um, that much traffic. But if you're, if you're getting started and looking at this, you're like, wow, how can I do that? My first suggestion would be write the best article you can every Monday and Thursday for two years and then come talk to me. You know, like that's the, um, that would be my, my first thing. Now there's plenty of strategy involved in how the site is laid out and who I reach out to and all that stuff. Um, but a lot of that, you know, I had to learn from experience that I needed those, those two years before to cut my teeth, so to speak, and develop that skill set. But um, yeah, you're, I mean, if anyone, anyone listening to this, you're welcome to look at jamesclear.com and, you know, use that as a model or a template for your own design or whatever. It's, it's totally fine. I think you hit the nail on the head though. A lot of people that have sites up for much longer. I know, for example, for myself and my brother, uh, we've had satoriprime.com up for three and a half years. Let's say mm -hmm. we don't get nearly that kind of traffic, but to be honest, we've only consistently put up blog articles and that's like once every two weeks for maybe the last six to nine months because we yeah. hated blogging before right we were like big video guys and we're like screw this and now we're just seeing the value of it mm -hmm. so i think anyone that's complaining like i don't have that kind of traffic i agree with you show up every monday and thursday and talk to me in a year and see where yeah. you're at right yeah yeah. And, and, uh, as a side note too, as far as video goes, that's totally fine. Right. That's a, well, the thing that we're talking about doesn't have to be for writing. It could be for yeah. podcasting, it could be for YouTube, it could be for anything, you know, like I, I know, I don't know much about YouTube cause I don't really do a ton of videos, but I was talking to someone the other day who has this massive YouTube channel. It's like, how did you do it? They put up a video every single day, 365 days of the year for like two years. And it's like, well, there's your answer. You know, like that, that's the main thing. I mean, think about not only about the consistency of that, but how much you would learn. Exactly. By, by forcing yourself to do that. That's the thing that like people are always like, Oh, what's the, the one solution or the one answer. And that's the answer is like, do all the work and you're going to discover what you need to know. And I think a lot of the time I was this way in the beginning, I thought, man, if I could just get, we think that like success in marketing or business is an event. Like it's a finish line. You know, if yeah. I just get featured in the New York times, then I'll be good. If I just get a guest post on this huge site, then I'll be set. If I just get to 10,000 email subscribers, then we'll be done. Um, but it's not that way at all. It's a lifestyle. It's a process. And that's the thing that that's probably the biggest shift for me is I embrace this idea of the finish line to get to is publishing every Monday and Thursday. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, not, not any other result and everything else comes as a byproduct to that.
Yeah. How, so what's your, what's your business model? So you decided to write, and I know I deal with a lot of authors as clients. So I'm like the, the biggest, my biggest hang up with writers. And I don't know if you're in this position. It's like, yeah. well, I wrote this book and I'm like, okay, great. What comes after the book? And they're like, uh, another book. I'm yeah. like, no, that's <laughs> not a business. <laughs> yeah. It actually, I was having this conversation yesterday. Um, you know, an interesting thing, I, I can't remember who I heard say this first, but I, I remember hearing someone complain about the word monetize for blogs. Okay. And I think I, I think I agree with that because a blog is actually a pretty terrible business because it's not really a business. It's a marketing channel. Correct. That is what a blog is or, or a YouTube channel or whatever. Correct. Now, there are some things you can do to monetize those, but when you have a good business, good businesses don't need to get monetized. Like nobody is talking about how do you monetize a gas station, for example. It's like, no, you just go and you pay for the gas. That's the thing you do there. That's the business. Nobody's wondering about how to monetize like jump ropes. It's like, no, you just sell someone the jump rope. Like that's the, <laughs> that's the thing that you do in that business, you know? Um, and so I think that a lot of the time it's an indication that you're trying to force something that maybe like that's not the good business model. You need something else other than the blog. So I, I hear what you're, what you're saying. So um, to answer your question about my, my business model, you know, I'm fortunate in that I built uh, some other businesses the first two years that I was going that I had running and that, you know, the employees still run at this point. I can just check in on each week. So I didn't have to make money from my site. Right Got now. it. And so that, that put me in a very good position. Um, and I, I do feel lucky and grateful for that. But, well, you built uh, them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. It's true. That's true. Um, but it, it made things easier. Um, and uh, but as far as I, I do think it should be a self-sustaining thing. I think this should be a good business, just like the other stuff that I built. So I am looking at that now. Most of the money that comes in now is from speaking engagements. I usually do one speaking or consulting thing a month. Um, I am going to be launching a book later this year, uh, but there's also going to be a next level after it. There's going to be yeah. this like masterclass, this, you know, six part audio course or whatever. That's going to be yeah. the natural upsell from the book. Um, and then I've had some interest from people about running a conference, um, which I haven't done before, but it would be kind of cool to do a high price ticket item like that and just get everybody together in person. Uh, which I think that really, if you're doing this to try to like make an impact for people or change people's lives, getting people together in person is where all those relationships really get built. So that's probably a natural next step for me as well. Yeah. I think uh, blogs to me or, or all of this marketing online stuff is, is a function to, I think most of the people that do it right are doing it because they actually want to add value to the world. They really want to make a difference for people. Those are the only people I tend to interview uh, here on the podcast also. Mm -hmm. And so I think ultimately all we're doing is building some sort of stage, right? So like your stage right now is 130,000 ears in the world, probably way more than that. But like, let's say those yeah. are your. Sure. Real well, that's, that's how I count my audience is the email list. I mean, yeah. So that, that's a massive stage, right? So I think that is how we impact the world. And I agree with you. Then you have to kind of give those people ways to interact with you and ways to be around you and learn from you and grow with you because look, they're on your list for a reason. They love your perspective of the world. And I mean, you, you have a pretty amazing perspective on the world, so it makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, I think that once you have a platform, you have a responsibility to the people that are on. Like I feel, man, I, like last night's a good example. I, I had to put an article up yesterday, um, but, uh, but it was my birthday. And so I was, oh, spending, a lot of time. Oh, thank you. Um, I was, I was spending a lot of time with family and friends and, you know, like relaxing and trying to have a good time, but I also had to get an article out and it, you know, it got to be late at night and I needed to put one up after, you know, the party had ended and stuff. And I was like, I was going to just sort of, I don't know, mail it in. And I guess, and just put something out there, but I like stopped myself just for a half second. I was like, no, you have all these people listening and they want something good and it's your responsibility to deliver something useful to them. So, you know, and I'm not trying to, I don't know, give myself some badge of honor or whatever, but you know, so I stayed up to one and got a decent article out and sent that out. And I, but I think that that's, that's what it's about, right? Like if it was just about to make money or just, just about something else, then I would just, I don't know, I just would have defaulted to the easiest thing for that particular task and moved on. But that's not what it's about. Like yeah. I would rather create something that stands the test of time and lasts until, you know, I think the coolest measure would be no one's going to care how big my email list is in a hundred years. Nobody yeah. will like, right? Like I could have a million people, 10 million, a hundred million. It doesn't matter. No one will care. But if you write 
one article that stands the test of time and people are still quoting that 200 years later, how cool would that be? Like that would be the thing where it's like, yes, you're really able to make a difference. Like there's, I wrote about a book called Meditations by Marcus Aurelius the other day. He wrote this book 2000 years ago, he was a Roman emperor. And it's like, uh, you know, what, what more could you do to make an impact on the world than to write something that sticks for centuries and people are still using to, to drive and focus their lives today with that. That I think is, is awesome. That's the type of stuff that like really lights me up and I think is, is so cool about entrepreneurship that you don't need permission to make an impact like that, yeah. to share something like that that lasts with the world. That's the thing that, that I think it's all about. 100%. I mean, I would also add to that because I know from, from your content and what you put together, even though there might not be this article that stands the test of time of centuries, I know that the stuff that you put out makes a profound difference in people's lives. You know, you have stories that I've heard you share about people losing weight, people going to the gym, uh, people hitting career goals, like things that they now have access to because of you, right? Now, a lot of times I always have this inside battle. It's like at the end of the day, we're all kind of regurgitating information. It's not like you're not mm -hmm. sitting there on some top of the mountain and like God speaks to you and like, Elon, this is the, right. you know, it's You're like the first person to think of this. Exactly. Yeah. Nothing that anyone says is the first person that's ever thought of it. So that I always have this inner battle, but at the end of the day, I'm like, you know what, what they're looking for is your perspective and your way of delivering that. Like how many people talk about goals, but from what I've read about your goal setting and habits, it's like, it's so user-friendly. It's so simple. It's so you don't try to make it like I'm some Harvard graduate. Let me just sound super smart. You're like, here's what's useful. Like, this is how you're going to actually get results. And I love people that don't have to try to make themselves sound smart. They just understand a concept to the core and then can share it from there. And I think you do that better than most people I've, I've heard online. Well, thank you. I think that right there sums up James. Birthday obviously out having a great time but you know what it was thursday and that meant blog posts needed to come out no excuses and the beauty is it's not about the money it's about the responsibility to making a difference it's about the responsibility to the leader and i said this also there have been so many times where i've just wanted to flake on posting a podcast where it just didn't fit in the schedule, whether I was traveling or something was happening. And I just said, you know what? Screw it. And then if, even if I release an episode late, people email me. And on the one hand, it's incredible because you understand that your voice is being heard by thousands of people all around the world, but it almost doesn't give you an out. And when you build a business like that, with that kind of accountability to not performing because it's about money or you have to slay some dragon or whatever, but just because you said you would, people started listening to you a certain way and expect certain things from you. That's why. How cool would it be if you got out of bed knowing that you're not living this day for you? You're actually living it for those around you, your family, your friends, your listeners, your audience, your coworkers, very, very different life. So we'll end it there with uh, part one of James Clear's interview. Make sure you come back for part two because, you know, we just keep going deeper and this is just incredible conversation James and I continue to have. And again, remember, our 10-day challenge is available. Satoriprime.com backslash 10 hyphen day hyphen challenge. So go and check that out and you'll be able to see a lot of the reasons, kind of what James was talking in the beginning, where he was too afraid to step out and do those things. Well, there's reasons for that. And it's usually the things that happen in between your head. And in 10 days, I promise we can alter that for you. So make sure you check that out. And we'll see you on part two of the interview with James Clear. Have an amazing day, everyone.